This is the story of Carson Air Flight 66. Carson Air Flight 66 is one of the many flights in Canada that crisscross the country, bringing much needed supplies to the smaller communities spread across the vast country. More often than not, these flights stop in multiple cities, bringing goods and cargo from the bigger cities to the smaller ones. Look at the stops of Carson Air Flight 66. It started out in Vancouver and then it was headed for Fort St. John with stops at Prince George and Dawson Creek. On Monday the 15th of August 2015, the pilots of Flight 66 got to Vancouver International Airport after a weekend of not flying. The first officer was the one who was first in and he started prepping the plane for the day's flights. The captain followed suit not long after. The captain and the first officer then finished loading the cargo for the flight and they started up the engines and the swear engine SA-226 taxied to the runway. After a quick taxi, the airplane was at the runway at Vancouver. After the takeoff run was started, the plane took off about 2,800 to 3,000 feet down the runway, which was completely normal for this type of airplane. Once in the air, Flight 66 was in contact with departure, and the flight was vectored north. Slowly, the Swear Engine 226 started climbing to its cruising altitude of 20,000 feet. On the controller screen, Flight 66 began to climb from 7,500 feet. When it was passing through 8,700 feet, the plane disappeared from the radar screens at Vancouver. The plane had only been in the air for about seven minutes and then it went offline with no distress call or anything. Flight 66 had been absolutely normal until it disappeared. The plane had been climbing normally at 1,500 feet per minute at a speed of about 180 knots. Nothing out of the ordinary for an SA-226 flying this route. And then for some reason, it just disappeared. The last few radar returns had caught the final moments of Flight 66. The swear engine had gone into an abrupt steep descent and it showed no signs of leveling out. The wreck of the plane was found in a debris field that was 1,400 feet by 1,000 feet on a mountain. They noticed that the less massive components of the wreck was situated at the start of the debris field and the more massive parts were further down the debris field. This meant that the plane had started to break up in the air before it hit the ground and the reason for that were aerodynamic stresses. They calculated that the plane started diving towards the ground at 30,000 feet per minute. That was more than enough force to rip the swear engine to shreds before they even hit the ground. What's even more interesting is that the damage to the plane was symmetrical. This was a symptom of high energy rotational damage. Then in the remains of the cockpit, the investigators found something really interesting, the trim switches. The trim system was commanding maximum nose down trim at the moment of impact. For those of you that don't know, trim is used to keep the plane level. If you trim the plane nose up, then the plane will have a natural tendency to nose up even if you don't touch the controls. And likewise, if you trim the plane nose down, the plane will, well, nose down. This was very strange. Why would a plane that was in a deep dive have its nose be trimmed all the way down? That would be like a driver stepping on the gas to stop a car. In a situation like this, you expect the nose to be in a nose-up position, so therefore the trim should be up, right? Well, since the plane was going to be in very cold conditions, the investigators looked at the de-icing system of the plane. If something had blocked the de-icing system, then the instruments could have given the pilots wrong information. That could have caused them to inadvertently point the plane nose down. This has happened before. But looking at Carson Air procedures, they found out that the captain would have had to turn on the de-icing system and check that it was on multiple times. The chances of them taking off without their de-icing system on was very, very slim. But the radar return of the plane poked a few holes in that theory. The plane nosedived in a very level way, that is, the wings were level. This would have exerted a lot of negative Gs on the pilots in such a way that they would have known exactly what was happening to the plane. Moreover, the dive was long enough that the pilots would have had enough time to recognize that something was wrong and then counter it appropriately. They also looked at the maintenance history of the plane, hoping to find something there. But nothing in the history of the plane told them that this plane had any problem whatsoever. This plane was in perfectly airworthy condition, and then it just plummeted out of the sky for no reason. Slowly but surely, the investigators were narrowing down the list of things that could have caused this accident. The next suspect on the list was cargo. Since this was a cargo plane, if the cargo shifted, then it would really mess with the center of mass, throwing the entire plane off balance. They pulled the data from the base of operation of Carson Air, 
and they found out that the plane had taken off with 2,050 pounds or about a ton of fuel and 1,400 pounds or 700 kilos of cargo. The weight distribution of the plane gave it a center of gravity index of minus 11.3. Now, this kind of answered the biggest mystery of the investigation so far, the nose down trim. Well, as it turned out, with this center of gravity, the plane needed to be trimmed to its maximum nose down position to make sure that it flew straight. So that partially explains why the plane was trimmed down so much. With that, it looked like they were back at square one. Nothing seemingly explained this crash. That is, until they got the toxicology report for both pilots back. The captain had a blood alcohol level of 0.24. You didn't get to that level of drunk without drinking for several hours before takeoff. Moreover, his liver painted a picture of a man who drank frequently. This was apparently such a problem that some other employees of the airline suspected that the 34-year-old captain had a drinking problem. In fact, one employee at Carson Air actually spoke up and they said that they smelled alcohol on his breath. But the captain's supervisor at the time did not smell alcohol, and so the captain was not taken off flight duties. We're all familiar with how drinking affects us, but how would a 0.24 blood alcohol level affect the captain and his flying duties? Even at a blood alcohol level of 0.03, your reaction time starts to increase. So if something happens that requires your immediate attention, it's going to take you a while to react. And that's just at 0.03. It only gets worse the more drunk you get. By 0.09, you start to lose critical judgment and some muscle control. By 0.18, your emotions are out of control. And by 0.27, you get to apathy. The man who was in charge of Flight 66 was feeling some or all of these symptoms. Unfortunately, the investigators were not able to piece together what the captain was up to during his time off from the airline. So we don't know who he met, how he slept, etc. All we know is that alcohol was in his system. Alcohol is especially bad for pilots because it reduces the ability of the pilot to take in new information and act on it. If you get sufficiently drunk, it can mean that you are incapacitated and you do not want to be incapacitated when you're flying over the mountains of Canada in a relatively small plane. Another interesting side effect of alcohol on flying pilots is spatial disorientation. This is because alcohol changes the specific gravity of the fluid in your vestibular system of the human body, or the stuff in your ear that your brain uses to find out what your body is doing. So yeah, alcohol can really mess with a pilot's flying abilities. And in this case, the captain should not have been in the air. But due to the state of mind the captain was in, we must ask ourselves the uncomfortable question. What if he did this on purpose? Now, unfortunately, we don't know what took place in the cockpit in the final few moments of Flight 6X as the plane was not equipped with a black box recorder. But some things are very odd about this accident. For one, there were no technical reasons that the plane would go into a sudden dive. Two, the dive was in the direction of travel. It barely deviated. Three, the nose was trimmed down to the maximum extent possible. Four, the captain made no apparent attempts to save his plane. And lastly, there was no mayday or emergency transmission from the plane. One of those on its own would be fine, but all of those together could and should raise a few eyebrows. The fact that this crash took place just 20 days after the German wings crash in Germany was just airy. This plane could have dropped out of the sky for any number of reasons, but which one do you think is the most likely? Let me know down in the comments below. Now, all of this is well and good, but here's the important question. How do we prevent something like this from ever happening again? A large subset of our population drinks. Some, if not most pilots, drink as well. So how do you prevent pilots from showing up to the job drunk? This is a problem that affects aviation globally, from Canada to the States to India, Japan, basically any country where alcohol is freely served. I've spent the past five minutes just Googling country names followed by drunk pilots. And sadly, most countries have drunk pilots. Wait, uh, what about Saudi Arabia? Well, I couldn't find one for them. So if you want to avoid drunk pilots, I guess Saudi is your best bet. But back to the question at hand. How do you prevent drunk pilots from flying your planes? It's basically random testing. That's how Canada does it. That's how Australia does it. And that's how many countries do it. I mean, it must be working. Drunk pilots flying are very, very rare. Sure, I have a few videos on my channel about it, but that doesn't mean that it's super prevalent in the larger world. 
because the prospect of random testing acts as a deterrent to people drinking before they come to the job. But do let me know what you think of this though. Why do you think the plane went into a dive? Which scenario is most likely in your opinion? Let me know. Now, here are my two cents. The thing that gets me about this crash is that the dive was very clean. If you look at the graph, it's just basically straight down. There were barely any twists or turns. It was just straight down. It was so clean that the aerodynamic damage to the plane was symmetrical, which meant that the plane was pretty much level. If you're drunk, I'd expect your inputs to be a little bit more uneven, a little bit less clean. In the Shaheen Air video, the plane was all over the place, but this seems almost calculated, precise even. But unfortunately, due to the lack of a cockpit voice recorder, we may never really know what went on in the cockpit of Carson Air Flight 66. If you want to watch another mini air crash investigation video, I'll have the video about Shaheen Air on the screen right now. You will definitely like it. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.